welcome. This is September the 5th, 2020. This is the Vancouver UFO Meetup. And our guest today is Desta Barnaby. She's a researcher and author of the book, A Glimpse into Infinity, Channel Messages Beyond Time and Mirroring Worlds, Channeled Reflections from Higher Dimensions. Desta had a close-up UFO site in 2012 and believes this helped her begin to channel. Messages came through her from various beings, some claiming to be ETs. And many of these messages have been published in her two books. She has spent most of her adult life studying numerous forms of energy work and healing modalities, including dousing for personal health and healing of the home, Dolores Cannon's techniques of regression hypnotherapy known as quantum healing hypnosis techniques and Reiki. She also helps others publish their books and runs YouTube channels that discuss topics from consciousness to the paranormal. Dessa loves traveling, particularly in Ireland, its people and its magical lands. Her travels also take her throughout North America and Europe to attend conferences on healing as well as UFOs. Desta Barnaby was born in, uh, and raised in Winnipeg, Canada, where she continues to live with her cat, Mika, and her dog, Berg. Berg loves dragging her out on daily walks in the forest near her home, especially when it's minus 40 in the winter. And more information about Desta and her work can be found on her website at www.feeltheshift.ca. And Dustin does a lot more than UFO. She studied many aspects of the paranormal, this dowsing, and also has a family history relating to these things. So Desta, welcome to the Vancouver UFO Meetup. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. So, nice to be here. It's also an honor to have you here because uh, in, in 2015, you were visiting Vancouver, staying here, and you, you joined our, and you gave your first sort of public talk about your experiences in UFO to our group. So it's kind of a, it's a real honor that you started with us, you know, with, with, with my <laughs> UFO group here. So it's great to have you back doing a video with us. You've recently been doing some videos. I remember Desso actually was here, I should tell the audience, on October the 1st and October the 8th last year. She gave two public talks, but didn't want to be videoed. But now that you're getting more out in public, so it's great to have you. So should we start with your sort of your own per paranormal experiences, like uh, through your youth or UFO experiences? What would you like to start with? Um, I don't know, wherever you want. Well, I guess I was so intrigued by your talk. It was quite electrifying in the fall. You talked about once seeing uh, beings outside of your window. I think you're, you're, you want to start with that story? <laughs> Well, I was, I, I can't remember which story that is, but um, is that the Vancouver story when I was I think in Vancouver? You said, well, you said like you're in knocking? bed with, with your partner at the time and there's beings right out the window. Oh, that was a, um, well, that was a hypnagog, I, uh, <laughs> yeah, I have many hypnagogic and hypnopompic dream states, right? So I, I've had that for my entire life um, since I was a kid. I think I used to, when I was younger, only see the spiders so I don't know if everyone knows what that is, but you know, when you're, it's like what, what could be explained, I guess, scientifically as it's just um, hallucinations because your body is still, you're, you're, you've opened your eyes, but you're really still dreaming. So they explain it by saying that you're still dreaming, but you're with your eyes open. So you're hallucinating kind of by seeing these things. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that that's what I think is, is actually happening, but I've had that my whole life and seeing spiders is one of the big um, things that many people see when they have these experiences and um, and so since I was a kid I, I've always seen the spider so I always I'm awake I sit up in bed I'm a million percent sure there's spiders crawling you know down the wall or hanging in front of my face or on my pillow or in my bed and I wake up turn the light on and I'm trying to get them out of the bed while I'm awake the whole entire time I'm sure that I'm not sleeping because I'm seeing them and I'm awake and I'm doing things and um and then somehow you just finally realize that that's not what's happening and turn off the light and go back to bed so i've had that my whole life but when i started to i guess when i was older i'm not really sure when say around 20 or something i started seeing other things so it's not just um spiders now it's just a, any number of crazy things but yes, so that time i was uh i had a i have a um a window right by my bed so I woke up in that state I guess and looked out and there was three yes I forgot I did tell that story there was three what seemed to be grays all pointing in the same direction standing right in front of my yard in the backyard and um, pointing the same direction so I was surprised and I got up and I said to my partner like there I turned on the light looked I, they were still there I could see them they were all pointing in the same direction and I said, oh my God, there's someone in the backyard. And he, of course, sprang out of bed, went running 
to the side door, ran outside. He was all panicked. And I could see them the whole time that he was running around the house still. And um, of course, he knew that I had that often. But of course, he wouldn't have thought that that's what was happening. And neither did I. And so it wasn't until he didn't see anyone that he came back and he's like, Good God, is this one of your things again? There's no one back there. And it's oh, only these like gray aliens. Like were they like yeah. three, four, three, four yeah. foot so short gray aliens? Well, I'm I don't remember them being short. Like I just remember them being three things standing in the backyard. And I was so surprised I was really wondering what they were pointing at. And I guess to, to, to the point of where I said it out loud, like there's and I said there's people in the backyard because I I don't I didn't say there's aliens in the backyard, but they were. I don't think they were short. I think they were tall, but, but either way, it was obviously, you know, not um, exactly that. But yeah, I, I, I've seen tons of beings. Lots of times they're just in the room. And um, it makes me wonder about other people seeing, you know, being in that state. And, and I always say that the, the state of state or whatever, where you're in between, you know, it's the middle of the night. So you're like half dreaming, half waking up and, and all that stuff. So you really wonder, but I have seen many, 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 many crazy things standing at the foot of my bed or beside me or beside, you know, whatever, flying in the air, hovering or whatever. And um, it, my interpretation of that is that it's the hypnagogic state where, you know, that it's not actual beings there, but because I've had it for so long and I've always seen something, I don't, I don't interpret <clears> that <throat> as me having a visitation kind of thing in my room. I interpret can it you as this define is, that for the audience. What does hypnagogic state mean? Can you and can maybe describe some of these beings? Uh, are they like ghosts like beings or what would you describe them as? I, <clears throat> I would say they're, um, well, so hypnagogic is like, as you're falling into, as you're falling to sleep. So when you're from, you know, your, your normal waking state, you would be in a beta brainwave state. And then as you're meditating or, or slowly falling asleep, you go into alpha and then you go into theta and, and, and then you go into delta. So that's like the range of how you fall asleep. So the hypnagogic is when you're falling asleep and the hypnopompic is for people when they're waking up in the morning. So they're going from the, um, the sleeping state into waking state. And so the, either way it's, it's the, the, I don't know, transformation between the two different states. And so, um, and that's all, also a time, obviously, when a lot of experiencers think they're being or are, you know, being abducted or taken and all that kind of stuff. So I've always kind of wondered, since I'm familiar with the, the scene, weird things in my room, but it was spiders for like a decade, at least, only spiders. And I'm not even afraid of spiders, so I never understood why it was spiders. But, um, but yeah, so, so, so the, that's the states and, and the beans are, any range of um, any range of different beings. I've seen things that had like, you know, like Mad Max goggles with weird smushed heads with big uh, capes standing. I've seen all sorts of anything you could possibly imagine. I seen my partner at one point. There was a, a bean. I, I woke up and there was there was something that was hover like um, crouched over him looking at him and um and i looked and uh, he he looked and saw me that i was awake and saw that i could see him and was very surprised and the crazy thing is he looked like my partner but um like a more of a he had like a geisha a, a female geisha's hair like headdress like hair set and he had a, some long cape thing on and um and as soon as he saw me and noticed me, he stood up. And as he stood up, he started floating and just basically floated all the way up through the ceiling till I could see the like his feet with this cape or skirt thing, you know, going through the ceiling. And I thought, like, wow, that's so weird. Because it looked like him, but it looked like a female Japanese version of him, which was again so weird. And so I thought in my head, once it moved, it went all the way up. I thought, I wonder what, like, that's so weird. Because like, why would it look like him? And that's such a weird thing or whatever. And the thought came into my head that it was a future version of him coming to check on him. So it like a connected form of him that was like, I don't know, but it was weird because he was like, when, when I saw him, he was literally just like hovering over, you know, like this staring at him. So, so I don't, I don't know. I don't know what any of it means, but um, lots yeah, of- I was going to ask you, what, is, what does it mean, your interpretation since you were there? Like the paranormal overlaps with UFO phenomena, like some of it could be you know, extra, extra crap from other planets, or some could be other realms of existence, other dimensions. And you've studied a lot of this stuff. You've been into a lot of different modalities. So I guess I'm always 
interested in your interpretation of your reality, what, what's going on, what you can share with us. Here. Well, that, um, that um, I would say like the, I don't know, I guess my interpretation is it's um, that it's not obviously a hallucination. I don't think it's a hallucination. I think because you're in this state where, you know, they could say that the veil is thinner or something because you're, you know, your, your left brain is more shut down because you were just sleeping. So it's not like you're thinking about, you know, what to make for dinner or, or um, you know, how much money you have in the bank or something. Your, your, your left brain is closed down. So your only your right brain is activated. So I would say that it's not a hallucination. It's a perception of like uh, the, the other dimensions. I would say all those things are, 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 you know, any range of the beings that are actually in these other dimensions because I don't know why he, the, and, and there's been many times when these things have looked at me and I've in my head said something to them and they've answered me. So if it was a hallucination, I'm not sure why the interaction and also it's many times that they're surprised that I can see them. And that's always a thing that makes me think then really, how is that a hallucination? Because why is it interacting with me? And the, why would the reason behind it being surprised that I could see it? Why would I project that something is surprised that I'm seeing it? Um, because that's just like a really weird thing, but, and it's not every time. So if it was something that was in my head, which I don't think it was, you know, that they should be surprised to see me, that's, it makes me think that they're real wherever they are, which you would, I guess, think it's a different dimension than that we just can't normally perceive or whatever. And that they're surprised to see me because normally we can't see into that, you know, realm or whatever. Yeah, I guess we can assume then that it is real. We go with that assumption. I know you recently did a video with the, the Winnipeg UFO meetup and Grant Cameron was saying that you have a whole family history of this and also that your family is supportive, unlike other families like us who are in, involved in this. So do you want to talk like, how do you interpret your, say your birth, your childhood, your previous lives, your mother, your father, how you got into this, like your, how you genetically and historically in past lives became this Dest of Barnaby. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I believe that we all came here for a certain reason. So I, I, I'm sure that we were all conscious before and had the decision and, and, and you know, made the, the, um, like made the choice to come here. I do believe in the Dolores Cannon because I've studied her, you know, because I do her work and I've read all of her book or almost all her books. I do believe that um, explanation that, uh, that there's like volunteers that come to this planet. So I think everybody on here, everyone that's listening, anyone who's like involved in this, um, this community at all, who believes in this kind of stuff and has had experiences themselves, I think that we are all the volunteers that are coming here because even if all the person, even if the person has never had any um, experiences, UFO sightings, whatever, even if they've never read, you know, a zillion books here, even if they've, even if they just started being involved in this, the fact that they're involved now and to me, to me, my interpretation, obviously only my opinion, but my opinion is that this is all the volunteers. You don't have to be born you know, understanding what kind of stuff this is, because who really is? Like hardly anyone, right? I, I'm lucky in that I did have a supportive family and, my, and not just supportive family, but my grandparents, um, you know, my, my grandmother was uh, very involved in this. And, um, and so I don't know if it runs in the family, but like, you know, I, I would say that that's probably true. My grandma saw Charlie Red Star, like granted the same year granted. Well, yeah, let's talk, let's explain for the audience watching, there's a lot of newbies. 1975, Grant Cameron, he describes, he got totally into UFOs because around Winnipeg area, there's this green UFO floating around. I want to tell the audience a bit what Char Charlie Red Star is and tell us about your grandmother's involvement because, yeah, like people like David Jacobs uh, say it does run in families, like things like alien abduction runs in families. So maybe shed a bit more light on that. Well, um, so, okay, so Charlie Red Star was, yeah, in, in the 75, uh, Grant saw in Ca Carmen, Manitoba, which is a small town 40-ish minutes away from just outside of Winnipeg. I have been there. I'm not really that familiar even right now. I don't even know which direction it is. I'm really bad with directions. It might be south. Oh. But wherever it is, it's there's very small communities, farming communities all around Winnipeg. It's not like Vancouver where you have bedroom communities. Like it's, I'm literally two blocks away from the outside of the city and there's no houses for hours after the outside of the city. We don't have little tiny, you know, a continuation of um, big communities or anything like that. So Carmen is like 45-ish minutes outside of here and there might be a couple, I don't know, hundred or thousand people living there. It's not like 
It's not like it's a lot of it's not in the Vancouver area. So um, so he went there to see it in 1975. I was born in 72, so it's not like I was, you know, around really. Um, but my grandparents had a cottage on Lake Winnipeg, Lake Winnipeg, and by, like by our Grand Beach. And I would, again, not hardly even know what direction that is, but I certainly didn't know that Carmen, Manitoba was on the other side of the lake. So the lake is huge. My grandparents had a lakefront cottage, so we had like a, they had a huge deck that just like overlooked the lake, and we would sit out there all night you know, like there's nothing to do. We didn't have TV. I think we had one channel in those days, right? There was like the news and then one channel um, at night. So there, there was nothing to do. So that is what we would do all night. And, and my grandma would say like, we see UFOs all the time over the, uh, over the water or whatever. And so we would just sit out there all night and be like, oh, is that one of them? And they were always red. But, um, but you know, I don't, I, I guess I believed it when I was a kid, but I don't know that I went around telling my friends that I ever saw them because it was really just lights and you know, I don't know, it's not like a spaceship came and landed in the, in the front yard or anything. So I just thought I would always see lights. And I'd seen a lot of like lights moving around. But I was too young to know if, you know, if the scientific backing to that was that, <laughs> do planes go like that? Do uh, helicopters go like that? Like I wouldn't have known, but I just knew that my grandma always said that she saw them. And so, um, so, but just only um, a couple of years ago, after I was, you know, uh, working with Grant, did I mention Charlie Red Star to my grandma? And she, and then we slowly figured out that 1975 was the time she started seeing the big red lights that came. And she told me, I have it, uh, like I audio recorded her um, telling the whole story um, of, of this, pl the red plasma ball, basically like following her down the, the, the road, you know, the gravel road of behind the cottage when she was walking one night. And uh, that was the thing that she saw came over, you know, the red lights that she was seeing over the um, lake came over. And then it was like, you know, you know, she, she said she was the only one there. My grandpa wasn't there or whatever. And she was walking down the road and it was following her. And, you know, I asked her if she had any communication with it. And I guess that was so long ago because in 1975, there was really not a thing where you would think you would have some kind of connection and could ask it questions or whatever. So she said no, but she said she wasn't scared, but she was running a little bit because it was following her and she was the only person around. It was the middle of the night and it was at the lake. So there was, you know, really no one around. So, but she said she wasn't very scared of it. And, um, and then she had another story where it actually was in Winnipeg, the same exact huge red, but fiery plasma -y kind of ball. Um, she saw it, uh, I think she said it was Christmas Eve or something when everyone left, she saw it coming down, like coming over the trees on top of all of the uh, houses in her, in, in her front street. And, um, and she said, yelled to my grandpa, here it is, like they're here, I'm getting my jacket, I'm going to watch and grabbed her jacket and started going outside. And she said it was just like hovering down the street, like floating down the street or whatever. And she got her jacket and, and ran out. And then I think only when she was standing on the front steps to go down did she think like should I be going out to be following this and she didn't end up doing it she just watched it go down and she didn't end up following it and she said you know of course that she always regretted that but um but that was I guess the two close-up uh encounters that she had and, and so whether that one was Charlie Red Star it was the same year and she told me that it was in the newspaper and stuff that uh like if you see this sighting call this number and she said she called them many times to tell them the story and she said because she was a woman in those days. Um, she just said that she never felt like they took her seriously or really cared about her sighting. So she was very upset with that and then never ended up calling or, or basically, you know, saying anything, not necessarily in public, because she certainly wasn't like hiding any of the things, the, the strange things that she was ever seeing. But, um, but yeah, she said she never ended up calling again after they kind of made her feel bad or, or that they didn't believe her or whatever. And she thought she was so excited to give them some information. She thought they, she thought they were collecting the information, but, um, but then I guess she kind of interpreted that like that they didn't really care. And it was, she didn't know why they were trying to get people who saw it to give them information because they didn't really care about the information. They didn't really believe her. <laughs> so she thought they thought she was crazy. So she, you know, wasn't going to call them again. But wow. yeah, can't remember the end of the question now. But yeah, I think uh, I was asking about your so how it affects you, your relationship with the, your mother, your grandmother, mother, like the family history. Like you said, you had like a paranormal experience when you saw a UFO in 2012, and you felt it was channeling to you. But I'm wondering, did it was this going on as a child? Like if you had paranormal experiences as a child, how do you yourself interpret it? Like does this probably carry over like you, you and I, I guess we believe in previous lives and it's probably something that might carry over from your previous life. 
do you see a continuum from your previous life or who you were before in this life now? And and tell us a bit about how your your say influences through your childhood, your teens, and your twenties that led up to all of this. Well, I would say about well, hmm, the continuation of consciousness. I would say definitely um, throughout your past lives. I mean, yes, of course, I I believe that there's it's a continuation, an evolution of your own soul, right? An evolution of your consciousness. So. You know, you ch I, I think you, before you come into this body or whatever, you're choosing what lessons you need to learn that you didn't learn last night. And you're figuring it all out with your, you know, soul family or whatever you want to say. The people that you keep reincarnating with, like potentially a small group of people that you change roles and help each other learn different uh, lessons every time you reincarnate or whatever. So I do think that um, definitely that we're the ones that choose everything that's going to happen to us. So I don't think anything's... Um, by accident i think we've planned any especially big things especially very abnormal or, or things like this a ufo sighting i think we've all planned that if we've seen something i think that's part of you know what what we um requested to happen in this life to then set us on a path of whatever the thing that we have set up for ourselves that, that we need to explore or where we need to go or the people we need to meet or whatever um i, I would disagree i think with the david jacobs thing in the way that i don't think it's like specifically um or necessarily like a genetic and i know that you know grant always talks about kick green and gary nolan that they're doing these things with experiencers trying to um uh, see if there's an antenna built into the dna and stuff and so and the david jacobs thing where it's just like if you know family i i would say that we that it's not necessarily that it's like family run it's that if we are these volunteers that are coming here to try to wake people up or you know and i don't know if that's even a kind of a rude way to say that but i mean so if we're here so say all of us are here as volunteers to some way help the planet while this big consciousness shift is happening whether that's just because we're not freaking out and panicking and so when, when the aliens come and there's a mass landing or something the people that have always known that we're the weird people that kind of know things like this are interested, they will either come to us and kind of ask us to like, you know, what the hell's going on and we would have some kind of background to be able to explain it or whether it's, we've always been the weird ones that are interested in this stuff. So when our friend, you know, even if it's not a, an alien invasion, it could just be a, you know, they start having weird dreams or they see a ghost or there someone dies and then they get a message or the dream that the, that their, you know, deceased loved one just comes and talks to them or, you know, have apports falling from their ceiling. If, if anything weird happens to our friends that never believed in this and we're the weird one, then I think that this is us being the volunteer coming here to help them be able to like not freak out and be the person that's going to listen to them because we've kind of like, you know, we've read the books or wh whatever we believe in it, or we've had the experiences so we can help other people that are new, newer to these things help to, you know, make them not think that they're crazy or shunning them from their families. Like a lot of other people do, we could be the ones that are more of an anchor to, uh, you know, I don't know, to be able to help them deal with whatever they're, coming up with like you know whatever things are happening so i think that um so it's not necessarily a genetic thing like a genetic thing to me sounds like you had no choice that i'm genetically uh, the aliens are coming to get me because they came to get my mom and they came to get my grandma i don't think of it like that i think i put myself in this body because this is the it's, this is the experience i wanted to have because i'm supposed to be engaging with the ets for some reason because and because i'm a volunteer coming here to help in some way shape or form i've chosen to be this so is it is it familiar like is it like a family link like that yes but i don't think in the genetic way where you're stuck in this position where the genes made you do it kind of thing i think it's you chose to be in a family that does it because you know your family has been doing it so it's just well this is an easy way to go i'll just be born into this family because you know that's why my mom chose to be here in this family that's why my grandma like everyone chooses to be in that family and it's easier to be in the family where these things are happening because then you kind of have a background so i don't necessarily think that it's um the way that they say it but i mean you know obviously who knows i don't know <laughs> that's my guess I think you're really quite uh, modest. I was impressed with your talks in Vancouver and online that I think you're someone with uh, spiritual attainment. I like the, how the lines are blur between spiritual qualities and ufology. That's why I'm kind of interested in your whole 
childhood experiences and stuff. But I think of you as someone who's kind of spiritually attained. I'm very impressed for that. Like I'm a Buddhist teacher, Buddhist fear, realize I'm kind of a C minus spiritually. I don't have that much higher realm abilities. I think you're just a natural at this. So can you sh share any more of your personal kind of like childhood experiences that, that stand out for you? Well, I, I don't think that's true at all, Brian, but, <laughs> but um, I think that all of us are here, like I said, I don't think anyone is higher in any way, whether I can say things differently or have read more about one specific thing, I do not, certainly do not think that there's any of us in this group that are, that are any um, different than anyone else. But um, my childhood, um, so like, because of my grandma, because I was interested in these things, I mean, when I was very young, I was reading, you know, whatever books were around. My parents, I guess, were, you know, kind of hippies. So they were very interested in other religions and other cultures. So, I mean, I was open in the way that, you know, if you're looking at voodoo or something like, ooh, the Haitians practice voodoo, what is that? And it's, you know, it's something weird. I was just interested in the weird things. So, you know, interested in different colors or different cultures and different religions really so I was more open-minded but because of my grandma I guess I was you know she taught me how to read palms and do astrology and tarot cards and these things when I was young and um, so I was more open to stuff like this but I did have a couple like when I was young you know my, my grandparents house was haunted so I mean I saw a handful of very scary things when I was at their house when I was young I, um, I had a couple of out-of-body experiences when I was, you know, in my early teens, 13 or 14 or whatever. So, um, did you want to I, tell us what you actually saw, like a ghost, what it looked like? You want to give us some details? Like, ooh, <laughs> <laughs> ooh, ooh, yeah. <laughs> well, um, it was like the, uh, it was, um, again, and I, and I wonder if this is what it really looked like because I was very young. So I don't know if my interpretation of it changed and, and or um would would if it would look different to me now than it did then so um i saw you know a handful of things and um like <laughs> in, the, in the when i would sleep at night i would pray every single solitary night of my life i slept with a nightlight until i was 40 since from when i was five because of these hypnagogic things so you know i would see these spiders and there would be you know beans in my room and stuff when i was very very young so i slept with a nightlight on from when i was five yeah till 40 until 2012 when i had that 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 um you host the big sighting and uh, then it changed to where instead of being terrified of seeing anything i was so uh intrigued or i don't know obsessed with seeing something that i instantly started sleeping in the actual pitch black with my eyes open all night trying to see something Whereas before I would pray, I would, I would never put my arms or my legs outside of the like covers in case a ghost would grab me or touch me or, or anything. I would never, if I heard anything, open my eyes, not in a trillion years. I would be terrified all night if I heard anything, you know, like I was very, very scared of all that kind of stuff until, um, until I was 40. But, um, but uh, yeah, so, so I did see, okay, so the things at my grandparents' house were like wispy you know, uh, I don't, I can't, I don't know if, I, know if I could explain it, but like, I guess kind of what you would picture, you know, like an ectoplasmy, wispy, smoky, um, uh, like a ghost, like a, like a, like a trailing white, um, ectoplasmic, I don't know, wind something. Uh, I saw things like move at my grandparents' house. I saw like the mattress of my aunt's uh, bed, which is where the ghosts were supposed to be, like depress as it looked like something was sitting on it. I would hear things, hear knocking sounds, um, especially at my grandparents' house, like many, many things there. But we would um, like, again, this is, a, so I was born in 72. So when, when I was like eight or, you know, whenever people would have sleepovers, I mean, eight, eight, nine, 10, I guess, sleepovers with all my girlfriends or whatever, we would, you know, we would try and, and maybe this is just because it was like, that was 1980. So maybe some of those early ghost movies were coming out or something. But I mean, we would like sit there at midnight, stay up till midnight and levitate each other and talk about Ouija boards and ghosts. And like, that is what we would do like the bloody mary thing in the mirror in the bathroom and as many <laughs> of those kind of things where you're trying to attract stuff and when you said levitate each other did you levitate yes and tell, tell us about that like you and others physically levitated 
like you know you would do the two fingers and there would oh, be four people like yeah, levitating yeah. The, the the person and uh, uh, switch. very lightweight i mean you can very lightweight lift people with that kind yeah. of psychic power so well, you accomplish I, that how old were you at the time doing that like again i would say i don't think we could have been six so i would say like eight nine ten wow um, I would have to look, but every single weekend we would have, you know, with my say eight closest friends or whatever, we'd have sleepovers every other weekend or whatever. And we would wait up till midnight thinking that that was the witching hour. And we would go into the bathroom and do the Bloody Mary thing and try and scare each other to see if you could see Bloody Mary in the mirror. Um, but we would do the levitation and we just, we didn't think it was um, a weird thing. And there was, you know, a, a couple people who, who would work the best because they would kind of like go into, and now I could say a trance-like state, but I mean, obviously in those days, we just thought they were sleeping. We thought it would work with a couple people because as soon as they would lie down and be the people to be levitated, we thought they went to sleep and that's why it worked. But we were- It's probably we were, some kind of meditation concentration. So all these little kids are about eight years old, you're saying, yeah. a bunch of you? Like how yeah. many of you? These are your friends in the neighborhood? Yeah, yeah. What well, about my brother, brothers and friends. sisters? brothers and sisters no no just like my eight girlfriends like my we, we had a like you know little circle of 10 people so maybe there would be like six seven eight people uh, how did you learn this did you study a book or something how did you learn these techniques i i really i was the only one that knew stuff like this and i was the one trying to scare everyone so i'm sure i'm the one that brought up the bloody mary and all that stuff and i would say that i got it from my grandma but again i was so interested in movies and stuff like that i don't know if i was you know, if we would just see it, I don't know if that was the year that some of those, um, I don't even remember what movies were around in those days, but I watched all the movies, all the like horror movies and, you know, alien movies and stuff. So I don't know if I, I don't know if it was from a book or from um, my grandma or from um, a movie, but that's just what we ended up doing. So there would be a couple girls that you were too scared. You have some natural be. ability, right? You probably have some innate ability of this stuff. Um, I, I would think so, every eight years old. I couldn't do that when I was eight years old. <laughs> but I just think because we didn't know any better and we didn't have any preconceived notions or beliefs that we couldn't do it, I think we just did it. And we thought everyone, like we really, I certainly didn't think that anyone couldn't do it. We just thought it's like a fun thing to do. I didn't know, we, we absolutely did not think it was something. I think you're still that way. Like Grant Cameron was saying in his video you just did just recently that he was really impressed. You were doing all this stuff and they're at, at somebody's house and you're doing all this <laughs> stuff. It's just like you're a natural. And you're so modest about it, Des. You don't realize your talent. I mean, Grant was very impressed with you. We should <laughs> mention for the audience, Grant Cameron is Canada's favorite, fam most famous ufologist, I would say. And, and he's kind of, uh, he stole Desta away from us. She was in the Vancouver <laughs> UFO meetup. And Terry Tabando said, oh, she was with the CCA group. He said, oh, he stole my girl, but he's doing a great, great job actually assisting Grant Cameron and he's doing excellent work. So it's good you've been working with him. But he was so impressed with what he's, what he witnessed, he said in the video. So, <laughs> well, so I thought I'd comment on that. I think it's relevant to your, your, just your whole UFO history and your paranormal experiences and your UFO contact. I think it's relevant to mention that. I, th I think that um, because of, if, if, if most of this, like, again, I think that the reason all of us are here, so whether just because I happened to be interested in it when I was very young, which was because of my grandma, you know, maybe I got an earlier start in trying to experiment, experiment with things. But I think that, um, that I don't think, I think that I was just more open minded and didn't know that there was a belief system. I wasn't taught that you couldn't do it. So we did it and we all did it. And um, so I don't think it's a uh, like, I think it's just because we didn't know that we couldn't do it or whatever. And I think that um, now that we're all, you know, the older you get and the more that new people are coming into this community, everyone, um, you know, is older and, and is set in their belief systems. And if they were from a family who really were telling them that nothing that they were seeing was true and trying to dissuade their, you know, potential new beliefs or something that that's shutting people down. So they just, I was just, uh, you know, because I was doing it earlier, I think is the only reason I, you know, I don't know, I was interested in it longer or whatever, but I think that everyone is, is here. And I think we're all here for the same reason. Um, like I was saying, um, to, to try and help the community, right? So, so whether it's because you're speaking or helping other people or, or just being there when your friends are having weird experiences or whatever, I think that, uh, that everyone in this community is here for the exact same reason whatever part they play it's like a, a huge gigantic puzzle and everyone's just a little different part of the puzzle or whatever 
Yeah, it is a puzzle. No one knows everything that's going on. We're like, it's like there's a higher realm and we're down here trying to put the puzzle together. Do you want to talk about later, your teens or 20s, any experiences that stand out? Um, <laughs> well, like, so in my early teens, I had a, a couple of uh, spontaneous out-of-body experiences. Like I said, I was having these um, hypnagogic things all the time. I had enormous amounts of time with uh, either like, uh, and, and when I was in Vancouver, especially was the worst ever, but I would have lots of times where I would just have like ringing in the ears, someone saying my name in my ears, um, you know, they call, and again, like I, I tried to look for the scientific explanation, they call it exploding head syndrome, which again, I think is ridiculous, like when you can hear a really loud um, bell or buzz or someone saying your name in your ear and they're just again pretending that's an auditory hallucination so I don't think that that's true but that's the explanation so I had that for years and years and years I had when I was in Vancouver I had the low tone ringing in my ears for literally almost the entire two years I was there to, I, and I went to like audiologist appointments and doctor's appointments because it never happened in Winnipeg and um and uh, so, you know, you don't know what that has to do with, you know, so some, so of course the new age community will say it's, oh, it's your angels talking to you and it's your, your whatever. And then the audiologist says there's, you have perfect hearing. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing that's making that noise happen. So what could it possibly be? Why is it, you know, never been this tone before? Um, but, you know, and then you can hear it's maybe because you can hear the fracking and maybe it's a fracking thing or an underground tunneling thing. And there's so many different and that's how conspiracy theories like you don't know what it is, but you know that there's something weird happening. So I would very often get, um, especially when I was in Vancouver, um, the, these crazy tones in my ears and there would be these black helicopters that would fly right. You know, I used to live in Maple Ridge, Maple Ridge, Maple, Maple Ridge. Maple yeah. Ridge. My, my dog park here is called Maple Grove, so I always get them mixed up. Okay, so Maple Ridge, I used to live there, right? Not at the foot of um, Golden Ears, but like, you know, near the end of Golden Ears, which I guess is what all of Maple Ridge is. But um, yeah, and I never noticed this, the, these black helicopters ever coming across the house. But uh, when I had this, this tone in my ears that only started in Vancouver, and it started after I had a, a so say a paranormal encounter, with these knocking that's what I thought you're talking about these beans outside because I had this thing where these there was a knocking outside on my window and I got ran out of bed to see what the knocking was and there was nothing there nothing in the yard um but the yard was lit up and it was um so the yard was lit up so and I just had moved to to Maple Ridge and uh, so my friend I just thought oh something must have been like I don't know what this knocking noise was but it must have been an animal or something and maybe it was a hypnagogic thing and I ran to the window and then the security light came on and so the whole backyard was lit up in a bright white light so it must have been you know a rack there's raccoons there like I don't know what it was but I thought I don't know why it was a knocking so much that I got out of bed knocked five times very hard on the window to the point of where I could hear the reverberation of the actual glass in the window of my um uh, my thing and this was uh, this was in 2013 and I had and I figured out later that it was a year to the date of that 2012 sighting um, and I was in Vancouver visiting to see if I wanted to move there so I was just there for a week or whatever and then this happened and then this big security light or whatever so I was like oh, okay so maybe the light picked something up so it must have been an animal and maybe it was my hypnagogic thing so I thought I heard a knocking but it's weird that it's the anniversary of the of the my one year of when I had this big sighting but then um, it took like a year after that till when I was actually in the house, uh, watching the house my friends were you know, in Florida or whatever. And um, I realized that there was no security light in the backyard. I'd never noticed that or wondered about it before because the whole yard was illuminated that night that the knocking happened. So I assumed it was the security light. And then I was out there on, um, you know, Vancouver is, is unlike the rest of Canada in the way that it's uh, New Year's Eve, right? And everyone has fireworks. I guess it happens. I, I think that's because of that's my birthday. I think that's why I want to make over celebrating the fireworks. You know, <laughs> yeah, <I assume>. right. <laughs> well, I was so surprised there were so many fireworks that I ran out there. Um, or was it, is it Halloween? Does Vancouver have ha fireworks yeah, on Halloween too? It's Halloween. Yeah. Okay. okay. Diwali happens at the same time. Oh, so Diwali, that's why. For that. Oh, I never knew that. I Okay, so sorry. It wasn't New Year's Eve then. It was Halloween because I thought... Exactly. Yeah. Why? Yeah, thanks. I, I didn't have any idea. And Diwali, that would make sense. I, I didn't, I really never even heard that. But I always thought like, why is there so many fireworks here? So I ran out there. I was like babysitting these kids. 
And, uh, and I thought, where's the security light? Why isn't the security light on? Because I was standing out there in the middle of the night and this was a year later and uh, there's no security light. And so I asked my friends the next day, like, what happened to the security light? And she said, we've never had a security light in the backyard. And I said, no, but the first time I was here in 2013, there was like this huge light in the backyard. And she's like, no, we've never, no one has a security light here or whatever. You know, it's like the, the back, the back, the backyards, uh, there's no back lane. It's like backyard to backyard kind of thing. And she Woo! says, no, there's, there's never been. Was it a UFO shining a light? Was it a UFO <laughs> exactly. or a black helicopter? Exactly. Or black just helicopter. another hypnagogic thing. You know, I don't know. You said you I'm saw just... a black helicopter, right? Those, those are indicative of, I guess, U.S. military. No, it could be aliens disguise themselves as a black helicopter. Is that the theory of black helicopters? That aliens disguise themselves as conventional helicopters? That it could be like a screen, like that they're giving the screen in, screen image screen that it's image, a black yeah. helicopter, or yeah. it's not really. But but that that the helicopters came when I had the ring when I was living there in 2015, and I had the ringing in the ear. And the only reason I ever knew that the helicopter was there is because the ring I, I lived downstairs in the basement, like sweet. And um, the hel the helicopter when it came over the house, even if I was in the basement, I was always in the basement. Um, the the tone in my ear. <laughs> because it was a low tone and the, it was the same, like, I don't know how to say, it was the same um, tone as what that, I don't know, motor or the engine of the helicopter was. So every time the helicopter would come near the house, my head felt like it was going to explode. And I had to hold my head because the tone of the, of the really low tone that was the ringing in my ear was the same frequency. I don't know what the word is, but like the same tone as the helicopter engine so that as soon as the helicopter would come anywhere in the neighborhood the 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 noise in my head grew to the point of where i literally was holding my head like shut because it felt like my head was going to explode so and it happened every day at noon and i and i never understood and like and i always said to my friend who i was living with like is why is there these helicopters is this like a news helicopter why is you know why is it a black helicopter over the and she's like i've never seen we're outside all the time there's never been a helicopter over at noon and i'm like i know that it's every day at noon now because like this the ringing in my ears i was almost going to move away from vancouver just because that 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 sound in my head was the absolute worst but got much worse when the helicopter would come and i knew it would come every day because it was like you know you know a thousand times worse than it was so I don't know what any of that is. So I don't know if that's a paranormal. I don't know what that even has to do with, but that was a very strange thing that happened for two years. So I took I many pictures. I wonder if anyone else saw it. So this is like, what, 2013 to 2015 or 2015 to... Sorry, sorry. Yeah, so 2013 was just the knocking on the window. That's when I yeah. went to Vancouver and she was trying to see if I was interested in coming to live with her. I didn't actually move there for the two years until 2015. I was there 2015 and 2016. So the ringing in my ear only happened when I actually moved there. And I was there for a couple months in 2015 and it continued the whole time I was there. And as soon as yeah, I left- I wonder if others saw it. Like there's ufobc.ca. It's the website and all the local people here who maintain the website and they're concerned about dates and times. Like I wonder right on their website, there might be something 2015, 2016 of people seeing black helicopters. It might be a record. That's what I'm concerned about what the month or the dates it might've been, you know? Oh, well I did, um, I don't know what this uh, website's called, but I do have it bookmarked somewhere. It had something to do with like the hum. So, you know, like the Bristol hum, the um, what's the hum called in uh, Ontario is the, uh, can't remember, but you know, the hum, the, like that's the hum. So, so I was, it was driving me so crazy that I started trying to figure out if anyone else could hear it. And I finally found a website and I did um, track, like you could put in your, your address um, and what time you heard it. Cause some people just get it for, you know, a couple minutes a day, a couple minutes a week. Mine was nonstop for months and then it would stop for a couple days and then it would be nonstop for months or weeks. And then it would stop for a day or it hardly ever stopped. It was there for 24 seven forever. I had to sleep with a fan on. I was like meditating every night. I was trying to beg the angels if that's what it was to turn the volume down. It was driving me out of my mind. And, um, and so I did go on that hum, whatever that hum website was to track where it was. So I have all the dates of different times that I was actually, um, hearing the hum and when the hum was happening the helicopters were coming every day so again the, the helicopter very very easily could be uh whether i don't know the police i don't know who uses a black helicopter in vancouver because you know I, I i wasn't you know i had just moved there so i didn't wow. know what what was happening exactly but 
I do have all those dates, you know, at, at some point I could search for them because I was tracking them and I did notice that the hum, a lot of people in Maple Ridge heard it. So that's what made me then look into if it was some like underground fracking or something that just some people can't hear and some people could just, you know, hear when they were doing some underground drilling or something like that. Like, I, I don't. I don't know. And, and I guess if you want to take the time, you could post it right on the UFO BC website. You're citing the dates or whatever. If you email to them, they would post it or would corroborate. I mean, everything takes time. I understand that, you know. Do you want to talk about your big sighting in 2012, which was kind of a significant to you? It's a really long story, but, um, but um, I had five nights of of sightings of many many different things um and it happened to be five the five nights before i was leaving for the first time um by myself on like a solo backpacking europe trip um by myself so i at the at, at the beginning of this interpreted the reason that i had these sightings is because i was like mentally in a weird place because I was, you know, nervous or didn't know what to expect. I didn't know if I could carry a 50 pound backpack around by myself. I didn't know if I was gonna, I was vegetarian at the time. So I was like, so insanely concerned that I wouldn't be able to eat properly because I'd be like backpacking and, you know, maybe they didn't have vegetarian food in, in Ireland. I was so crazy. But, um, but uh, so I was very like, you know, I don't know, nervous or, or, or whatever. So I just thought that that's the reason that possibly I was seeing things because again, I was in a strange state where maybe I was somehow more open to being able to see things that um, maybe not everyone could have been able to see. I don't know if that's, I don't know what the reason is, but, um, but uh, so yeah, so five nights I saw, I don't know how much of the story you want, but. Um, well, it's it good to be different. detailed, I think, because you, you can do more than one video. I think your whole life story should be separated over many, many videos with lots of different people. <laughs> It's good to be detailed so you don't have to keep saying it again and again in other videos. <laughs> well, that's the thing is I did just say this, so that's why I don't know how boring this is going to be. So uh, maybe oh. I'll take a bit that I haven't, I haven't said yeah. is uh, one part that I've hardly told anyone because it's such a long story. I don't really tell everyone the whole story, but I did have a, a short story to the best part of this five night sighting was um, that, that I say consciously called um, this light that because for the say two-ish days before this, I was seeing so many different lights in the sky and things I was calling fireballs and all this different stuff. And uh, so, so, you know, on the third night or whatever, I saw another light and thought like, well, here we go again. Here's like another weird thing happening in the sky. I don't know what's happening. And, and as soon as I saw it and recognized that it wasn't just like a, you know, a plane or something, it wasn't, you know, going in a regular plane like direction kind of thing. Um, I, I said, if you're a UFO, come here. And the, the literal second that I said that, it turned, it made a 90 degree angle and turned and started coming for me. And, um, and uh, like, so the, the short version of it is, so it came, it uh, hovered on top of this elementary school a couple blocks away from my house, which I was standing right in front of. So it was say 50, you know, to a hundred feet away from me, say maybe 30 feet on top of the school, which was a one level, you know, school or whatever. So say 50 feet away, 50 feet up kind of thing. And um, hovered there, the uh, brilliant, you know, insanely brilliant, uh, bright white light. And it sat there and like, you know, what I thought of was sat there and stared at me. You know, it's, it came from a long distance. It took many, many minutes for it to come all the way through the, through wherever it originally, you know, started from to come towards me. And then went and and kind of sat on top of this school and um i had the uh, experience of time slowing down of uh this uh frozen body state where i was like um you know all of a sudden all the bugs stopped to the cricket stop chirping kind of thing it was silent i was frozen i was perceiving time in a in a very um like time slowed down. So I was perceiving, you know, like milliseconds of time of what was happening. I didn't know what was happening. I didn't see anything. There, there wasn't anything else happening except I was like trying to run away. And that's when the, this happened is like the second before I started running. So as I was like, my body was frozen and time was slowing down. I was feeling in the, the milliseconds of time, my, my, frozen body trying to propel itself 
to to do the running part where I was trying to run away and um and you know like I couldn't hear anything and I was just frozen so that so however long that took and then um it you know it I finally was released from that or whatever ran a couple steps was uh completely um overcome with emotion heartbroken that I that they were leaving and they were leaving me and so I immediately turned around, ran, and, and started following it. And it changed from the white light to two red blinking lights at the back of it. And I ran as fast as I could, bawling my eyes out, running um, towards it. And then it just kept going. But as soon as that happened, and this is maybe the craziest part, and that's why I, I don't usually say this part, but as soon, so, so, I, so if I was sitting here, it, it was coming in this direction. I said, come here. It came in the, this direction. The second I ran, it went back this way and then I chased it. So it went back in the same direction it was coming. So as I, and that's just the, the outskirts of the city here, which is I'm, I'm only a couple blocks away from the outskirts of the city. So I chased it and, and it was two uh, red blinking lights and it went, you know, until I couldn't see it anymore. And I was bawling the whole entire time thinking like, why are you leaving me? You know, take me away kind of thing. And so it goes, and then I think, you know, and then I just decided to start going home. <laughs> and then as I turned around to start going home, another thing came, which was also a bright light, um, a bright, like gigantic bright light, but it had two lights, which made it seem like it was a different structure than just whatever the structure of something just being one bright light. I could never see the craft at all, ever. I couldn't see anything. It was the brightest, brightest, brightest white light. And then when it left, there was two blinking red lights at the back. So I could never see, I could try and picture, I was trying to picture what, how big it could be based on the distance of where the light red lights were compared to where the white light was. And I kind of thought that maybe it was the size of, if two people, two skinny people were sitting beside each other and there was like a, a globe around them, basically. Like I was thinking like one person or maybe two skinny people could sit side by side. And if there's just a bubble exactly encasing two people, so however big that is, right? Like the size of two normal sized people sitting in a thing. That's about how big it was. So not that big, like this, you know, smaller than a very small car, but you know, not much smaller than a very small car. And so, and so this new thing that came, so, so they, so this, the, the two red blinking lights went south and then coming this way, all of a sudden was two new lights and, but they were much bigger. The lights weren't bigger. The distance between the two lights were bigger, which made me think that whatever the shape of the actual craft, which I could not see at all was bigger, much bigger. And it came sideways. So it, so, so if they were leaving uh, south, then this came east to west. And it was, and again, I was so surprised because there was never any sound on any of these, on anything this entire five days, N nothing ever had a sound. So this new white light comes. And again, I keep thinking, I was thinking that this other thing was a drone it, until I was bawling my eyes out and the time slowed down, which I didn't really understand. I did, I thought it was a drone. I, I never thought it was a UFO. Even though I said, like, if you're a UFO, come here. I didn't really think it was. And I didn't really think obviously that I was going to be able to call it here. So when it left and only because I was so emotional and wishing it could have taken me when this new light come came i i didn't Im instantly think it was a drone i just thought what the hell is going on here like is this a normal thing where people see all these different things in five nights i'm in winnipeg whoever comes to winnipeg if this is a drone stuff like this is really weird this is getting really weird so this other thing comes these with these two big white white lights which was a huge, which a much, much, much bigger thing, but no, no sound. This is over the perimeter highway in Winnipeg where it's the highway it surrounds, it's a circle that surrounds the entire city. So it's, it's, I mean, it's Winnipeg. So it's like not super busy or anything. It's not, again, nothing to do with Vancouver, but I mean, there's no way that there would be no cars there. And it was coming up along in like the little bit of a field between where the backs of all the houses were, then there was a field before this big perimeter because it's noisy and then it's the country. And so, and, and this thing was coming right alongside the, the perimeter. And I just thought there's no way that everyone isn't seeing this. There's no way. And there was not tons of cars. It was like two o'clock or one o'clock in the morning, but there was a car once in a while, like, you know, every couple seconds, there would be a car, maybe, maybe not a whole bunch at a time, but you know, and this, the, this huge white light was coming right up against the perimeter. And I just thought, what, what the hell is this now? And when it came, I could, I could tell it was much bigger, like say five times the size of this little tiny thing. So say five very tiny cars. So I mean, again, not gigantic, but much bigger than the first thing. And um, it shone the light down 
So I thought it was a helicopter because, and I didn't, and I don't know why I even thought that, but, but because of these lights and I was just thinking like, what on earth is this? Is this the government now trying to look at this, but there was no noise. And I didn't know if that was even possible. Again, it was 2012 and I don't know anything about planes. Um, so I didn't know what it was, but it shone the light like the the actual light that you would like a you know an abductee would see a light or travis walton like the light that comes down or maybe his was a pillar but this was a light like this like a triangle super bright white light shining it like it was a helicopter looking for something like a police helicopter looking for something on the ground needing this you know huge beam of of light directed to the ground or whatever and uh and and it stopped so and i was sitting there obviously i was the only person i was two in the morning at the edge of the city and there was a couple cars going once in a while but um but it came the opposite like crossing the direction of where you know the the other things went and it shone this this crazy light down and i and with no noise and i just thought like is this the government was that really a ufo and is this the government and why doesn't it sound like anything is this a different kind of drone so i was really just trying to figure out how big it was and what exactly it was doing it stopped to a complete and 100 percent stop there was no noise when it was shining this thing down and i was wondering if it was shining the thing down on me trying to look for me to see if there's any people watching the ufo or if it was trying to find the ufo like i had no idea what it was doing and and i was just so confused with the thing that I had just in the, been in the middle of bawling and uh, wishing I wasn't on earth anymore. So it's like, I don't really, I was just trying to go, okay, like how big is this thing? And trying to remember in my head how big it was and what was happening. It came to the complete stop, had this light shining down, you know, maybe went a little bit more. And then all of a sudden it took off and kind of went around me on top of all the houses and flew so insanely fast that I just thought, again, is a drone something that's faster than a plane? How big is a drone? Like I had no idea, you know, is it possible that helicopters have no noise? Like I didn't know what it could be, but it was just the strangest thing. And when it went away, it didn't disappear like people would say a UFO just in one split second disappeared. I saw it fly away, but it was so fast. It was absolutely not. And there was no noise. So, I mean, I don't know what it was. I don't know what exactly it was doing. If it was looking for that thing, why wouldn't it know? It didn't seem to be looking for me. I was standing right there. I wasn't hiding or anything. Um, but it was really right in front of me. And that was even, it was probably the same thing. It was probably 75 feet, like um, from where I was 75 feet up, much higher than the original thing. The original thing was you know, I don't know if that's 50 feet above the ground or something. So this one was like straight up where the other thing I was kind of always looking at it, like more of an angle like that. And this thing was straight up. But anyways, it had the, the light beam, like it was a helicopter searching for something, but it wasn't a helicopter. I don't know what it was. And then it took off and went through and I turned around and watched it. And it was, um, yeah, it, it flew right through the entire neighborhood, like in, you know, three seconds, I couldn't see it anymore. Three or four seconds, I couldn't see anymore. So very, very quickly. But, um, but it didn't disappear, it flew away, and it flew very fast, and yeah. <laughs> so again, it's a long story, because I saw a lot of things, but that I never actually said, I don't even know if I've told, I've probably only told one or two people ever that part of it, because the story is very long, and that's like a really weird thing, so I don't know, I don't know what it was doing, or what the intention was, but. I think it's good to re record this, your memory is so clear, you've got a very good memory. I think maybe soon we can, open up for, for questions. We got, there, there's six of us here, but I'm wondering, uh, you had this heart connection, like you're bawling, you know, take me away. Was it a feeling of loving kindness? From a, it reminds me of a story actually from, from the, the Buddha and the Buddhist discourses. Uh, there was this very virtuous lay woman and one of the devas of the four great kings came down to see her. In Buddhist cosmology, in the first of the six heavens, there's the four principal devas, the four great kings. One came down to see her and they told her, you know, the Buddha's coming here next day. Be a lot of merit for you to offer a meal to the Buddha. So everyone was very impressed. This lay woman, wow, the, this really senior Dave is coming down to see her because she has such virtue. I wonder if this is something like that. I mean, uh, the way they describe things 2,500 years ago in your experience, like you, you asked for it to come to you. So it's very impressive. Like if it's a, a Deva, well, Deva is just a term in Buddhism for anything higher realm. It could be angel or even alien. David just means, so I'm just, uh, you know, intelligence means connecting the dots. I'm just trying to connect the dots there. But what was your heart feeling? Like, why did you feel that way? Why did you feel that way? Um, well, I did get two, like, you know, messages or something when, when, when the light over the school was there. Um, at one point, I said, when I started to get scared, excuse me, I got the thing in my head that said, like, we're not going to hurt you. But again, even though I knew a lot about um, 
like I'd watched all the UFO movies. I had a lot of books. I don't know if I ever would have known that there's any telepathic link normally with these things. So when I got the I, the thing in my head, like, we're not going to hurt you, I didn't think it was coming from that. I thought I put, I thought that was me talking and I didn't know why I just said that to myself, but it made me feel better. So I just didn't think about it. And then after it was there and after it was waiting there for a long time and I started to get scared and I was thinking in my head, what is it doing here? Like, what, why is it, does it look like it's staring at me? it said, or the idea came in my head where it said, we're scanning you. So, and again, and I thought I would never, I didn't even know what that really meant. So I knew that that wasn't coming from me, but I didn't think it was coming from that. I thought it was just an idea that popped into my head. So I didn't think there was a connection, but I did, um, you know, at some point, maybe many years later, like many, many years later, at least five years later, maybe I said, I had um, like a reading or I can't even remember what exactly was happening, but it was a guy who was channeling um, right at the beginning of when I started channeling and I didn't know I was channeling. So I, I was just kind of like looking at these people that were getting messages like I was getting because I didn't know what was happening when I was getting them. And uh, so I got, a, I got a reading from this one guy and he, and so I said to him, I told him the story and I said like, who was in the ship? Like, I think I, I asked something like that. Who was in this ship? Because it, it, you know, it did come when I called it. And uh, so, you know, what was in that ship and why did I have the time slow down and did something happen that I just can't remember? And he said, um, he said, you think that you, cause I, you know, of course the story is I randomly was just walking around, you know, at one o'clock in the morning for the five nights before I took this trip because I was kind of stressed. I was trying to get some exercise cause I was gonna be backpacking or whatever. And cause it was really hot in the day in July in Winnipeg, it's like, you know, hundred degrees every day. So, so I was, you know, I'd walk at midnight when it was windy and there was no one around and it was dark and cooler. And, uh, and so I, and I, I guess I kind of told him that I just was randomly outside and then all this stuff happened. And he said, you think that this stuff happened because it was a random event and that you just happened to be outside and, and then this stuff happened. But he said, this is the, the, what was in that ship was you from the future. And you, you knew that this was the time. So this was like a set up time and date that you were always supposed to go interact with this thing. So it wasn't some ran, you weren't randomly taking a walk. You weren't like, you know, bored or stressed or, or just deciding to go for a walk. This was a meeting that you were, you know, that you set up before you came here, like before you were born kind of thing um, to, to not wake yourself up, but to put yourself on a new path. And that's why I said that earlier in this, because I kind of believe that, 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 that this is things that we set up in our own lives um, from our own selves. So it's like you, you're, it's like you're not even you from the future. I don't know if I would even believe that, but I would believe that it's like, that's something that I set up before I came here to, you know, start the new obsession with a very specific part of ufology or the paranormal world in general, like the new obsession was set up to be more involved in this kind of thing because I designed that. So I put that light there and maybe that's why it didn't look like a ship because it didn't need to be a ship. It just needed to be something that made me go, holy shit, like Grant has a thing called the of Wow, where um, he, he thinks all these things just happen so you can go, wow, and then be interested. In so I think it's maybe the same thing. So the, the thing set this up, I set this up, and it didn't need to be a spaceship, a silver thing. It needed to be something where I said, wow, enough to wake, to, to, you know, put myself on, 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 you know, a new path or obsession or rabbit hole or whatever you want to say. Maybe. <laughs> uh, Brian, you're muted. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm cutting down my own background. I was just saying, uh, <laughs> wow, you, you from the future, that's good. That's an amazing interpretation if you got that message. Um, yeah, I'm open to a lot of things. I mean, uh,